So, uh, hi everyone, and welcome to the third event of our 2021 TPOP Festival. Um, so TPOP is the UK Terrestrial Evidence Partnership of Partnerships and is five years old this year, um, as is the Terrestrial Surveillance Development and Analysis Partnership. So given these notable birthdays, we wanted to celebrate the wide variety of work that the TSDA partnership has undertaken over its life so far. Um, my colleague Anna Robinson is going to introduce the partnership to you and explain the breadth of work it has and um, is currently involved in before we hear from our partners about 10 of the work areas in a series of five minute presentations. So that's five areas of development work and five areas of analysis work. So it's going to be quite a fast paced event. Um, and my stopwatch is very much at the ready. Um, and even though we can't cover everything um, undertaken in the partnership today, hopefully this will give you a bit of a flavour of what's involved in each topic um, and we'll have an opportunity to discuss any questions we've got later on. So please use the Jamboard link that will be shared in the chat to raise any questions that you might have. Um, I think Anna shared it, but we'll share it again just for people still joining. Um, and we'll try and keep the questions on there and not within the team chat. And then following the event, we're very happy to discuss any work areas of interest further with you. Um, and please do get in touch using the TPOP mailing list um, or the TPOP email, sorry, um, which is at the bottom of the slide there. Please note that we are recording this event um, and the recording will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, so please turn your cameras off if you don't want to be seen and keep your microphones muted during all the talks. Um, then just before we get started, I just wanted to remind you about the other events in our TPOP festival. Um, in particular, the closing date for registrations for the Habitat Recording Workshop is today. So um, do sign up for this if you're keen to get involved with that. And there are still spaces available. Um, the recording for the first of the Barriers to Inclusion um, talks is on YouTube. And the second recording will be up by the end of the week. So they can be viewed if you want to catch up on them. I think that's enough from me now. And I will pass over to Anna to say a bit more about TSTA now. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Nikki. So yes, I was just going to give a quick overview of the TSDA project, which stands for the Terrestrial Surveillance Development and Analysis Project. Um, so as a TPOP community, so our collection of surveillance scheme organisations and um, policy people from various environmental public bodies in the UK interested in collecting biodiversity evidence, we're really conscious that there's a massive amount of biodiversity collect data collected and that's really great but we also want to improve the evidence base so the tpop collaboration was set up five years ago to help us work together and learn from each other but alongside this collaboration we also wanted to have some dedicated resource to explore issues relevant to developing the evidence base to help us make the most of the data we already collect and um, to try out new analytical techniques and things to help so we set up the Terrestrial Surveillance Development and Analysis Project in 2017. It was a five year project and we open tendered it with the project being awarded to UK CEH and BTO to work with JNCC. The project has involved a very wide range of people. So currently on the management group, we have myself and Nikki from JNCC, Michael and Nick from UK CEH and Rob and Gavin from BTO. But we've also had many other colleagues who've been involved in various tasks. And today we also have Rob Boyd and Stuart Newson presenting a couple of tasks um, in the summary presentations we have just in a little while. Alongside the management group, we also have a steering group of representatives from the country conservation agencies um, who've been very helpful in guiding the work to try and make sure we have the most impacts in the work we do and have also been providing some QA function, giving comments on outputs. And also we've been working closely with the whole TPOP community. For example, we've had a couple of workshops through TPOP events, which on, have um, we found out more about habitat recording and that's information's being used to inform some of the TPOP tasks that we're working on. So some of the TSDA tasks that we're working on. So a bit about um, the content of the TSDA project. I won't go into any detail about specific tasks in this quick introduction because um, we're hearing more about specific tasks later. 
but um, starting with the development side of things. We started with a review of evidence needs from across the UK public environmental bodies. And this was followed by a review of coverage of existing biodiversity monitoring and where there are gaps. We then looked into how we could improve the situation. Partly we considered existing monitoring schemes, for example, a piece of work considering um, how we can make the data products coming out of our TPOP schemes as fair as possible. So this stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And another piece of work um, we've done is exploring how and whether it would be useful for existing monitoring schemes to collect more data, There's more habitat data. The TSDA project also considered unstructured records and how we can get more out of them. For example, would there be greater value in encouraging recorders to visit, revisit certain sites to improve our statistical power to improve trends? And we've considered integrated modelling of structured and unstructured records. Another aspect of the TSDA development work considered broadening the evidence collected rather than just working on existing schemes. For example, we've, we're keen for TSDA to look into new technologies and we've had a bit of a focus on acoustic monitoring technologies that we'll hear more about later. So moving on to the analysis strand of the TSDA project, I'll just share a few examples of things we've been working on. So we've analysed impacts of invasive non-native species for different taxonomic groups. We've carried out some predictive modelling, for example, in improving species distribution models and in creating models to demonstrate the impacts of different planning development options in relation to in urban areas, um, in relation to bird communities. We've explored how you would address policy questions using different types of data and different analytical techniques. And we've done a fairly large chunk of work to help understand impacts um, of protected sites using data from bird and butterfly schemes and recording data from a wide range of taxonomic groups. I note that whilst we have categorised the tasks into these two an analyst, analytical and development streams, there are obviously linkages and overlaps. For example, where analysis to improve our understanding of data leads to recommendations in where we should focus our effort to improve things. So in this slide, which um, Michael pulled together a very helpful diagram, you can see there's an awful lot of linkages and an awful lot of tasks that have been covered. So some of the key themes that Michael pulled out is in trying to summarise the overall focus of the project included improving our understanding of ecosystem state, getting more representative indicators, improving analyses with new statistical methods, improving volunteer engagement and de developing new protocols, and predicting drivers of change and management interventions. I also just want to highlight the very wide range of tasks that we have covered over the five years, so some big tasks, some small tasks, and it's covering a pretty impressive range of topics. You can also see there are several linkages with um, tasks related to multiple topics and needs of environmental public bodies. For example, the work exploring passive acoustic sensor protocols could help with volunteer engagement as well as helping to produce more representative indicators and better informing ecosystem assessments. And I would also note that several pieces of work in TSDA have linkages to other pieces of work carried out by partner organisations. The initial review of coverage work has been taken on board by GNCC when working on proposals for our engagement in the Natural Capital Ecosystem Assessment Programme, helping us to identify that monitoring urban areas is a gap that needs filling. And another example is the work on the targeting revisits tool, which links to a related project that UKCEH have been involved in called DECIDE. So moving on to the final slide in this introduction, introductory section, we're really pleased to have such a wide range of outputs and we've targeted these to a wide audience. We are going to 
update the JNCC website to have a summary of the key outputs coming out of TSDA and we will be sharing a link to that um, hopefully in the next TPOP bulletin that comes around. But also just to highlight the range of outputs we've used. So there's been a massive amount of reports and papers that have come out of it. So publishing in scientific papers is quite useful for um, reaching the scientific audiences and, and um, everyone knows it's gone through robust QA um, if we use that um, communication approach so that raises our profile and credibility so that's been good. There have also been several JNCC reports particularly where the content is particularly useful to TPOP audiences e.g. the report scoping evidence needs. And we've also produced some shorter policy notes and guides. For example, we're currently working on a guide for using structured and unstructured data. And we'll do a policy note on key points from the recent task on the effects of protected sites. And we've also done several presentations and webinars over the years, which we're keen to record and put on JNCC's YouTube channel so that people can get back to them and see them again or share the links with others to watch them and just wanted to mention as always we're looking to improve how we do things so if anyone has any comments or suggestions for how we could better communicate outputs with you then do please let us know there's an email address up there which you can use or if you just have any questions and want to find out more about the work then do get in touch and ask us so we're now going to hear a series of mini presentations on various tasks within TSDA. We'll start off with five tasks on the development side of TSDA before stopping to have an opportunity for questions. When, so you can put questions using the Jamboard link in the chat and then we'll have a second series of presentations on the analytical side before stopping for some more opportunities for for you to ask questions and us to answer them and if we run out of time to answer them or we will make a note of all questions and um, summarize them and answer them and put that a lot up on the YouTube channel alongside the presentations. So I think that's all from me so next is over to Rob Robinson from BTO on the review of coverage of terrestrial surveillance schemes. Um, so yes, so um, right at the start of this um, sort of partnership, uh, quite some years ago now, it feels, um, what with everything that's been going on, um, we started to say, we, well, we started out by asking, um, well, what do what do folk really need? And when I say we, what I really mean here is Michael, who um, did a fantastic job um, of canvassing um, the uh, the various sort of stakeholders. Uh, particularly the sort of the nature conservation bodies um, in terms of um, what their what their needs were from sort of biodiversity monitoring. And I think uh, that assessment um, which you can which you can find on the on the web on the website um, highlighted a need to increase sort of both um, spatial coverage and um, coverage of um, species. So we're very aware that um, there are certain hotspots um, partly related to volunteer density, um, um, but also some species are more popular than others. So we were trying to sort of get a, a handle on, all, on what those, um, what those um, uh, coverage gaps uh, were. And I think the that assessment sort of um, indicated that in improving taxonomic coverage would help, as, as it says there, with um, getting broader perspectives on how well the environment is doing and um, in increasing the spatial coverage. Um, obviously uh, helps um, uh, better understand sort of geographic uh, distributions, but also um, what's going on in different parts of the country. Um, and I think the, the, the thing that particularly came out of that needs assessment um, that we should um, perhaps continue to think about is that increasingly there is a need um, for assessing the importance of interventions. So relatively small scale monitoring, and that's something that we might pick up um, a little bit later. Uh, but here we're talking about um, the national monitoring schemes. 
uh, sort of, if I can have the next slide, please, Anna. Um, so just to very briefly talk about some of some of the sort of the ha very high level results. If you want to know more, then do go to go have a look for the. Um, um, again, this is a, this is this was um, uh, this sort of assessment of coverage was done by Jenny Border, a BTO, with input from lots of folks from BTO CH and elsewhere. And in terms of uh, taxonomic coverage, um, I think we uh, found that um, species fell into three broad groups that I've sort of outlined here. Um, there was obviously um, things like birds, flowering plants, butterflies, people like, there's lots of volunteers, were able to develop well-structured uh, monitoring schemes for those. Um, there are other species that um, we do get quite a bit of information on, but it tends to be less well structured. Um, so some of the mammals, for instance, amphibians, reptiles, um, and that provides a sort of a, a starting point, um, perhaps for thinking about how we might improve coverage for some of those species. Uh, and there are sort of various initiatives ongoing under TSDA, which we might hear a bit, little bit about later in terms of thinking about how we can do that. And then equally, there are some species that are really quite um, challenging to record and there's the sort of uh, an assessment of those individual groups in the in the report. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so moving on to the spatial coverage, um, the sort of the map on the left um, there shows um, the sort of the percentage of species for which we have good data um, by um, 10 kilometer uh, 10 kilometer squares and for a definition of good data go read the report um, but what it shows um, not terribly clearly unfortunately but it shows patterns that um, are perhaps not unexpected that um, coverage is um, better in the south and the east and when you get up into the north and west where volunteer density is lower then uh, coverage does tend to drop off. And certainly here at BTO, we've been trying to address that through things like the, um, the Upland Rover scheme where we have people doing additional BPS squares. Um, of course, um, spatial coverage is not just in terms of geography, but also in terms of habitat. So we um, picked up on the fact that upland type habitats, so moorlands, moorland bog and that sort of thing, uh, tend to be relatively poorly covered across the piece. Uh, so this, so we didn't do this analysis just for birds. We did it for a whole range of um, taxa, and that's um, uh, perhaps not terribly terribly surprising. But um, when you think about how important moorland habitat is in an in international context, it's perhaps a uh, it's perhaps a definite gap. Um, other things okay, were perhaps you've got half a second, half a minute left, Rob. Okay, I'm 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 getting there. Um, um, uh, other, other, other gaps were perhaps a bit more surprising in terms of a lack, uh, relatively poor coverage in urban areas. The map on the right just sort of uh, makes the point that um, this uh, density of coverage does, does affect the resolution for which we can generate small scale patterns of trend. So in the south and the east you can ge generate relatively small scale patterns of change, but as you move further north and west, you need to look at larger and larger scales, which of course influences um, what we can what we can say and do. And then if I can have the final slide, please. Um, so the take homes for, for us on that uh, were better coverage in urban areas, as I've said. Um, the sort of rather complicated graph at the bottom looks at how well trends um, can be done uh, in relation to the number of visits. And actually what we found was that uh, we have lots of single visit um, squares um, and actually what um, a good thing to do is to encourage repeat visits. And I think Michael will come on to talk about that very shortly. And also I think this highlighted the need or highlighted the benefits perhaps of combining data sets and that's informed a major strand of the TSDA work program that we might talk about a bit later. And I, I will finish there. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, swiftly on to the next talk, um, which we're going to hear from Michael Pocock about um, targeting revisits. OK, thank you very much, Nikki. So next slide, Anna. It's, it's like a government um, government press press thing, isn't it, with the next slide? Um, what we know is that there is, um, as, as Rob said, there's an incredible wealth of biodiversity monitoring which goes on. And one of the strands of that is the opportunistic data, we sometimes call it, the sorts of records which come in from volunteers 
um, wildlife recorders as and when they want. And it's this incredibly rich source of data. And we know that the, the amount of records is going up exponentially over time. There are so many more records coming in. But one of the key things about this is that we don't simply need more records, more records of the same old species from the same old places. Um, actually, I think there's a principle here that, that it's valuable to have more informative records. And of course, we can think about what more informative means on a range of different axes. And this is one particular angle. So next slide. One of the ways in which we can use these unstructured or opportunistic data is, and we can use them for trend modeling, and one of the methods is to use occupancy analysis. That takes account of the, the fact that these species are not perfectly detected um, e each time a, a particular site or square is visited. And, and so it's one of the methods that we can use and have used successfully to do modeling of a range of different species. And one of the things as we were reflecting on the report that Rob was just talking about, one of the things that dawned on us is the fact that sites or one kilometre squares as we define them are only included in the data sets where we do the occupancy now analysis if they've been visited in more than one year. And so that then felt like there was a real opportunity as on the next slide. Because we were thinking if we can encourage people specifically to visit sites where we've only had records in one year, then both the current record and the historic record get added to our data set, which is probably or seems like a really efficient way of increasing um, the data that's available for us to do analyses. As I said, this is just one of the angles for thinking about how we can improve um, our data. And so what we did was we developed, um, myself and colleagues developed this targeting revisits tool. You can find the link on the BRC webpage. And this is takes um, data that we've currently got on species records and it updates it in real time via records submitted um, through iRecord. And the key, the key task here really, or the key ask is um, to record is can you make records so that you turn the pink squares, which have only been visited in one year to green, those which have been visited in more than one year. We'd love you to have a look at this and um, maybe a bit late to do too much recording, but give your feedback. So the final slide now. Um, what we've done is we've developed this for four particular taxa, as you can see on the top right. Feedback so far has been very positive, but we'd love to receive more as to um, you or, or your colleagues and wildlife recording networks that you know to find out what people think. And over the course of the winter, we'll be doing an evaluation um, of these four trial schemes compared with other schemes to, to think about um, whether that's had any demonstrable impact on the number of records or the, the quality of data that's come in. And I think one of the key things about this is that this is actually leads on, I think, to new forms of thinking about um, if you wanted to be fancy, you could call it adaptive sampling so that we can have a more precision citizen science people might can still be encouraged, can still submit records from when and where they want, but might be encouraged where those particular places or when those particular places might be. And one example of that actually is it's led on to the DECIDE project, which was a big NERC funded project, which was then taking a different, um, a slightly different measure of in informative records and have been developing interactive tools to support recorders in doing that. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Michael. That was great. Um, now we're going to hear from Nick Isaac from UKCEH about fair data, uh, fair principles for teapot data products. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nikki. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of a, a review that was actually led by my colleague Tom August, who's on the call today, but I'm, I'm presenting. So. Um, I'll tell you what fair principles are in a moment, but uh, we've heard that the, the teapot partnership is, is quite broad and contains many schemes producing many different types of data. And the next slide shows one application of those data. It shows the index of priority species and uh, changes in the abundance of priority species in England between 1970 and 2018. Uh, it's based on trends in 149 species 
and uh, at the bottom you can see the number of species in each of the data sets that contribute to this composite multi-species indicator. And you can see that some of them are from familiar schemes, the Breeding Bird Survey and the Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, and the National Bat Monitoring Programme, surveys that are, are part of TPOP, and there are other data sets in there that are outside of TPOP or, or, or that are very small. Uh, so there's a, a great diversity of data sets that contribute to this index. And this is just one example of the more diverse ways in which scheme data is being used to inform on questions about biodiversity and how it's changing. So the next slide takes a more uh, general uh, view of, of, of what data products are. So a data product is, uh, you can think of it as everything between the raw observation and, and, the, and the use. So over on the left, we've got people collecting data in the field, making observations, uh, writing them down, recording them somehow. And over on the right, we've got these sort of high level summaries that include both biodiversity indicators, but, but also websites, maps and, and reports. And in between, you've got various stages of analysis uh, uh, that, that become increasingly sophisticated and complex that bring together the data sets in a, in a, in a way uh, that summarizes them uh, and uh, makes them available for for these these high level products these these high level outputs and and this is what we call data products and it's so data products are not just raw data they are they are um, um, typically come from a from a statistical analysis and in the context of biodiversity indicators the main ones we're thinking about here are annual indices of abundance and when we when we want to bring together lots of data sets from across the schemes, we need to think about how they're created because they're often created in different ways. And this leads on to the next slide, which is around the, the FAIR principles. And FAIR is an acronym. It's, uh, it derives from a paper published a few years ago now, and it defines these four desirable properties for data products and, and, and how they should be produced. And, they, and it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. The first two are more or less self-explanatory. It means that the data can be found, for example, by a web search and, and can, be, can, be, can be accessed, can be, can be downloaded. Um, and the last two, interoperable and reusable, more really refer to can, can they be used and, and particularly can they be read by a computer and interpreted in a, in a usable way and, and therefore reused. And there's a, there's a, a lot of the, the detail behind what these, these principles mean refer to the metadata, the data about the data. And so uh, we, we did a, a review applying these, these principles to the, the, the set of TPOP schemes and, and a couple of other schemes. And the next slide just shows you the report that we produced. It's available on the JNCC website and uh, you, you'll, you can download it. Uh, I won't go into the details of the report, but just to say that we made eight recommendations for TPOP schemes about how the FAIR principles could make the data more accessible and uh, better, um, more able to be reused. And I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, very concise. Um, we're going back to Michael now um, on realising the potential for acoustic monitoring to meet policy needs. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. As um, So if we go on to the next slide, as Anna introduced, we did um, a needs assessment right at the start of the TSDA project. And, and a couple of things which came out of that was the um, country bodies realised or communicated to us that we need a better and broader assessment of ecosystem health and also addressed the fact that they felt that new technology could be really beneficial in supporting some of this. Within TSDA we particularly considered acoustic monitoring and I'm going to talk about some outputs which was mainly, mainly came from a interdisciplinary workshop including a range of people from um, policy, from research, thinking about those who are more interested in the technology and those who are more interested in the ecology and management. That was led by Tom August. So poor chap, he's, um, well, good. He's, he's getting a lot of credit um, for the good work that he's done. So on the next slide, <clears throat> what we've done is we've brought together five of the, the needs 
um, which we were thinking about within this workshop and some of the potential for acoustic solutions. So using acoustic monitoring to address these needs. One of the ones when we think about the, the highest level of society is the need to broaden engagement with nature and, and the awareness that this seems to be something that's really important to do when addressing the biodiversity crisis. So citizen science was recognised as one particular way and actually the potential for new technological or technologically led ways of monitoring um, is potentially important and valuable for broadening that engagement with nature. It can open this up to new audiences. And then one of the other needs that we address, the second one there, is to assess condition at landscape scales. We need to go beyond the, the very tightly defined site. And in fact, on the third one, we also need to go beyond the, the specific focus on, on single taxa surveys, whether they might be um, birds, bats, butterflies, um, whatever, but be able to get a broader overview, both so then at the taxa scale, but also at the landscape scale. And in terms of acoustic solutions, we realised that the, the potential for low cost sensors seems to be really valuable. And that can be done at the level of soundscape monitoring. So this is going up a level beyond what we're usually used to recording and reporting on, but thinking about that, um, the diversity of the soundscape and also its, its source, whether it comes from um, natural or, or human sounds. And, and that's really helpful to assess that condition at the landscape scale. Um, Acoustic sensors also provide the opportunity to provide multi-taxon recording and to do that in a really consistent way, particularly once we've got workflows, which Stuart's going to talk about in just a moment to process the data. Then when we think about the specific populations and changes of populations, in particular to particular interventions, which might be agri-environment scheme management or various things like this, Acoustic sensors and acoustic solutions provide that opportunity for having continuous and low cost data collection, and it can be done at scale. These sensors can be placed out and provide um, continual monitoring of the environment, and that can be done remotely through, um, uh, through wireless technology as well. And then the final one, we can actually use acoustic sensors to, to be able to think about having nuanced assessments of ecosystem services. And in particular, when we're thinking about maybe bat feeding passes uh, or feeding buzzes, things like this, we can use acoustics to assess behaviour and function. And on the next slide, we also address the fact that, as Nick was just saying, this requires some fair data practices for standardised methods for thinking about data and the data about data, uh, thinking about data sets available for benchmarking as the technology changes both in terms of the sensors and automated analysis to be able to make that consistent over time. And then it requires this collaboration, which is why the value of bringing together this network of people was so valuable. And in particular, having that link between policy and, and the primary research. So on the final slide, we're aware that there are limitations to acoustic monitoring when we're thinking about this as the classic, how do we monitor species and things like that, but it does provide, as I've said, so many more new opportunities. It allows us to think beyond species monitoring. And it also allows us to then use this as a model for thinking about other new technologies and the way in which they are deployed uh, through citizen science or volunteer engagement using things like um, DNA approaches, whether that's barcoding or functional genes or various other various other different methods. And one another um, spin off project which has come is using these sentinel tree sensors to be able to tell us something about um, the state of individual trees and their health. So there's a wide range of, of really exciting and new opportunities for thinking about new technology to address some of these important policy needs. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, continuing on the acoustic theme, we're now going to hear from Stuart Newson um, on monitoring terrestrial mammals um, with bats and bush crickets. OK, thank you, Nikki. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So um, I'd like to, uh, as Nikki said, to stay on the, the acoustic monitoring colour thread and uh, focus on 
one of Michael's points that he raised on the need to move beyond single tax on surveys, multi tax on recording and workflows to be able to process this type of data. Um, so I work at the BTO, but uh, as many people who know me, I've had um, uh, a personal interest going back a long way in, in bats and in bat sound identification. And um, quite a few years ago, I realised you put out a bat detector and you can potentially record a lot of other stuff, a lot of other species groups as bycatch when you do that. Uh, one of the most important groups is bush crickets. Um, at the right time of year, you quite often get more bush cricket recordings than you do bats when you're bat recording. And for bat workers, uh, this is a real annoyance. But for me, I kind of saw this as an opportunity. Bush crickets are quite poorly monitored in parts of their range. And uh, if we could identify bush crickets automatically, as well as bats, they're recorded anyway. Uh, so rather than discarding that information, if we could identify them automatically, there's a real opportunity for improving our understanding of bush crickets. And uh, a number of years ago, I worked on the sound identification of bush crickets, and this resulted in a paper in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. Um, but I also realised that uh, small terrestrial mammals are also recorded as bycatch during bat surveys. And um, this was a real knowledge gap in terms of the potential. Can we, is there potential for, for monitoring small terrestrial mammals um, as bycatch during bat surveys? OK, next slide, please. So, um, so initially, a lot of this work was carried out in my own time. I uh, started working at existing collections of small mammals. So places like the British Wildlife Centre, deploying detectors to try and build a library of sound recordings that I could then use to understand the range of variation of calls that are produced by different species. I also carried out a lot of uh, local live trapping and uh, in the photo you can see my, uh, my what I call my recording studio where um, I would live trap individuals in my garden or locally. They would, they would end up uh, for a short period of time in these terrariums where I'd get recordings. Um, and uh, I collaborated with a number of people, but particularly um, Neil Middleton and Huma Pierce, who are named here. Next slide, please. So thanks to the TSDA, uh, it gave me some time to try and uh, write this up and uh, what I wanted to do is highlight the real potential for identifying uh, small terrestrial mammals as bycatch during bat surveys. So this resulted in a British wildlife paper, which is shown on the right here. And this is really a guide to the sound identification of small terrestrial mammals in Britain. Uh, for many of these species, nothing had been documented before um, on the calls of, um, calls of these species. So, for example, on the on the left here, you've got two spectrograms. On the top, you've got common shrew, and on the bottom, you've got pygmy shrew. So visually, these are two very similar species, but their calls are completely different. And because of this, there's real opportunities to identify these species acoustically. Um, through this work, we also made a sound library available where you can download uh, example WAV files, uh, sound recordings of different species, and also there's playable spectrograms. So a lot of this was really trying to highlight the potential to identify small mammals or um, small terrestrial mammals. Next slide, please. So I think as a conclusion, this work really, it does really highlight the potential to identify small terrestrial mammals as bycatch during, during bat surveys. Uh, I should say that there are caveats. So um, among small mammals, some species rely on sound to a lesser degree than others and are less vocal. And also the call rate of small mammals is much lower than than bats and bush crickets. So you don't generate um, like thousands of recordings, but it still generates some information for these. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities. There's applications for identifying things like uh, the presence of brown rats, black rats, house mice on seabird islands, uh, identifying the presence of scarce species like uh, hazel dormice, which produce very distinctive calls, and for harvest mice that again produce very distinctive calls. 
uh, particularly if you're putting bat detectors out anyway to record bats, you could identify these um, these other species at the same time. Um, I've also worked on building uh, algorithms to identify these automatically when they're recorded during bat surveys. So I'd already carried out a lot of work on sound identification of bush crickets, but uh, through this work, I was able to build in sound identification of small mammals as well. And to make this accessible, we we launched the the BTO acoustic pipeline. And this is really a system that anyone can use where there's a desktop app. You can upload recordings to the cloud. They're processed and the results are returned automatically. Um, and as part of this, we're planning to try and look to extend the taxonomic coverage. So at the moment it covers birds, bush crickets, small mammals, uh, but we're looking to extend that to nocturnal birds um, and to also extend the geographic coverage um, over the next few years to the rest of Europe. So to give an idea, through the acoustic pipeline, um, we launched it early this year. We've had in the region of about 20 million recordings uploaded through it. Um, we've had about uh, 5 million bat recordings, 4 million bush cricket recordings, and a kind of fairly modest uh, kind of 30,000 small mammal identifications um, through this. But I think it kind of highlights the potential of acoustics. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is the, the pipeline itself is kind of not externally funded. But what we've done is taken a, a model where uh, it's free to use up to a level and then uh, mainly for commercial use, there's um, a charge to use it. So what we're trying to do is set something up that's sustainable for the future that will fund itself. And so far this year, um, the system's covered its own costs. So um, again, I think a kind of very different model, um, but I think it demonstrates that this type of approach can effectively pay for itself and uh, hopefully we could extend it and develop it in the future. Um, I'm just going to end there, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Stuart, and thanks to all of our speakers in the first um, chunk of talks there. Um, we've got some time for some questions now. Um, we've only got one on the Jamboard so far, so I'd encourage anyone to um, add their questions there. Um, I will uh, say the one that we have got, though, for Michael. I don't know if you've seen it in here. Um, could one argue that targeting the same old species on the same old sites is preferable? In this case, we have a defined and constant spatio-taxonomic scope. Otherwise, might be difficult to estimate trends for species or places that weren't sampled in early periods. Would you like to comment on that? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely correct. That that is one of the types of uh, information within data that's really valuable. My argument would be that um, obviously I wouldn't express it publicly as the same old species in the same old places. Um, but those those data are being collected anyway and and people are going to the places that they enjoy going and recording the species that they encode, uh, enjoy recording and so some of what we're trying to do is is explore ways where we can see how providing information on some specific aspect of need might encourage people to um, diversify or expand their recording beyond recording those um, in, in those places. And it may be that there are a particular needs where we would encourage people to go back to the places which are already well recorded um, in certain circumstances in order to gather uh, richer and more informative data. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, we don't have any other questions in the Jamboard at the moment, so I suggest that we move on to the next set of talks and we um, leave a bit more time for questions after this um, chunk of talks, if anyone has any for either of the sections of talks that we will have had. So um, on that note, we are moving on to hearing from Gavin about the potential for analysis of monitoring scheme data to inform about the impacts of invasive non-native species. Over to you, Gavin. Um, thank you, Nikki. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, uh, so exactly that. Um, could I just ask uh, Anna if you're putting these, um, doing running the slides on this, 
please uh, sort of click three or four times on each slide because there's an animation and it'll get a bit, um, it'll just get tedious if I have to keep saying click. So if you go to the next slide, please, and then we click um, sort of six times, that'll be good. So what I'm going to talk about is basically a novel that's cool. One more, thank you. Um, there will be a novel application of the data from monitoring schemes and the idea that behind this is to try to apply the the data to this context of non-native species which we know are a critical threat to current biodiversity um, and what we're talking about here is not about in locating initial invasions because the, the data we have are best are not suited to locating when things first turn up but we are talking about our asking the question can we really detect detrimental effects of a non-native species which is part of the definition of what is a formerly an invasive species and secondly measuring the effect the the extent the seriousness of uh, the invasive effects of things which are we do know or we do see as having those detrimental effects on native species so currently all of this is determined simply by expert judgment and our question is, can we quantify these effects and therefore um, I'd help to identify those non-native impacts and also support classification in that in that area? So next slide, please, Anna, and do uh, click sort of four times on that one. Yeah, that'll do for now. Um, so what we're doing is looking at integrating the data from different schemes on native and non-native species. And the schemes we have, the structured data schemes that we have, identify distributions and abundances of species. And they allow us to test for uh, sort of effects on distributions, which we can call spatial effects, and also uh, population trends, so effects over time. And analyses to do this can therefore be within scheme, i.e. that's one bird or another, and another bird, for example, or it could be between scheme, um, either uh, mostly between different taxonomic groups when they are between schemes and we tested a, a bunch of um, examples of this and I should say this work was done uh, led by my colleague Henrietta Pringle um, and we tested a bunch of things using combinations of data sets so the first one is the potential relationships of parakeets with whole nesting birds and looking at effects of grey squirrels on, on birds in woodland um, Muntjac is one particular deer species that can affect the understory in woodland and woodland birds and then also parakeets and noctual bats um, on the basis that they are there has been work done particularly overseas I think uh, saying that this this has been identified as a, as a threat so one click please Anna um, and to do this, the, the challenges with doing this is that the survey protocols uh, vary between these different species, these different groups and the, the um, different schemes, um, which means they're not necessarily straightforward to combine. And particularly that involves the mis, um, spatial mismatches is a, is a challenge. So next slide. Please. So the analyses of these, um, which is a quick quick um, summary of the results. So what we did specifically with parakeets and birds is looking at the population growth rates um, in what BBS squares that do or don't have parakeets in them more or less, um, but also do our urban type areas because that's where the parakeets are. And compared species we expect to be affected by parakeets or potentially might be like starlings nesting in holes and others that are in the same sorts of habitats but are less likely to be affected. And the results of this showed that um, there are marginally more, a larger proportion of whole nesters affected by um, parakeets, but overall the patterns or associated with negative effects of parakeets, but overall the patterns are quite equivocal about what's actually happened. Um, next slide. Thank you. Uh, next click, I mean, that's fine. Um, and so the next one is squirrels. So in this case, it's the same, basically the same test, same testing approach. But in this case, um, we found much stronger relationships. So some of the control species are not going to be affected. They nest in holes. They're much le less likely to be affected by squirrels. They were negative, but many more of the open species that we would expect to be affected were. So we're, we're finding some, some evidence of 
of negative effects or impacts of this, this species. Next slide, please. This is a one minute warning, Gavin. OK, thank you. Um, so on the uh, the muntjac one, so with woodland birds, again, it's a population growth rate test and we find um, marginal effects for more negatives. And another clip, please. Um, parakeets and noctuals, however, there were no significant relationships at all, or no significant relationship with that, um, uh, with the two approaches we used. That's with National Bat Monitoring Project, uh, pro project Money um, Data, sorry. And next slide, please. So concluding, you could do three clicks on that, please. Yeah, um, so we find we think this provides a novel insight. We think there's some useful uh, results, which we can argue are potentially, they, if they don't show what we expect, they could show issues with data quality. And there are various issues with the data quality in this context. Next click, please, Anna. However, they may also show um, limitations of the other evidence. So we actually we are testing these things directly. So expert judgment may not be 100% correct. And this may show more insights. Um, and two more clicks, please. Thank you. And so the this we do have quantitative evidence of real effects um, and there we I do want to flag, however, that there are significant challenges with combining data across these different schemes. So that's something we are working on at the moment to try to see how those things can be fixed. But we can apply the same approaches to other um, environmental challenges across different taxonomic groups. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gavin. That was great. Um, now we're going on to hearing from Rob Boyd um, from UKCEH about some species distribution modelling work. Thanks, Anna. Hi. So, so yeah, so I've been involved in various tasks um, under TSDA, and most of these have involved species distribution modelling in some capacity. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the models that we've set up and how they could potentially complement um, the some of the, the temporal trend stuff that's been doing elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so at CH we, we work very closely with the Biological Records Centre, so we have access to a vast quantity of biological records. Uh, these data have very large spatial, temporal and taxonomic extents, which means they are potentially very useful for research. Um, one of the main applications of these data so far has been to estimate temporal trends in species, usually species distributions. Um, but it would be it would be useful to use these data in a slightly different way and to estimate spatial variation in species distributions. In other words, in what parts of the country are species like to, likely to occur? Um, and the most common way to do this is to use what are called species distribution models. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is the species distribution modeling workflow that we have set up, and I'll rattle through this quite quickly. Um, I should say first off that we've um, We've implemented this workflow for about 6,000 species. We've fitted models for about 6,000 species. On the left here, we've got the input data. So that's the occurrence data that I've already mentioned. We've also got some, some environmental data, uh, both land cover and climate covariates. We use three species distribution modeling algorithms to establish relationships between the covariates and the occurrence data. And this allows us to extrapolate predictions about species distributions across the whole of the UK. Uh, we actually make five sets of predictions with each algorithm, which gives us 15 sets of predictions for each species in total. We combine these to make an on, what's called an ensemble, which is just a weighted average of the predictions um, based on how well the, the models fit the, the occurrence data. Um, these predictions are on a continuous scale, but we do discretize them to try and get um, binary predictions of suitable versus unsuitable habitat, which could be useful in some cases. Um, and we also look at uncertainty and have evaluated the models using various skill statistics. Um, but probably more importantly, we've sent the, the models back to the recording schemes who provided the data to try and get their opinion on whether the models are performing um, well or whether they're not. Uh, next slide, please. So, so like I said, I've um, I've worked on various tasks. So I, I I just thought I'd pick out one example just to try and demonstrate the sort of thing we can do with species distribution models. Well, I'm starting to regret picking this example because it's quite a lot to unpack. Um, so what I'm showing you here is basically the the overlap between protected areas in the UK, 
and the what the models tell us the the predicted species distributions and this is for habitat specialists only and um, so on the y-axis there you can see proportion of suitable habitat covered by protected area um, on the x-axis you can see the various taxonomic groups the different color boxes are different countries within the uk or the uk as a whole and the, the spread in the boxes just represents all the, the different species um, so, so that's just one example of how we can use um, these spatial predictions to, to, to complement the, uh, some of the, the work on temporal trends that we've done elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. So we can answer a whole new type of question using these SDMs. Other examples might include looking at um, prioritising areas to place new protected areas, lots of things that involve um, geographic space as opposed to um, temporal space. Um, but we need to establish whether the models have overcome what are in many cases very severe biases in the data um, and hopefully the, the expert elicitation that we're, that we're doing at the moment will help us to understand whether or not the models have overcome these biases. We've, we've certainly incorporated some, um, some mitigation measures that we think might help, but um, it's yet to be seen how good they are. Um, and then once these models are evaluated, hopefully we can and um, use them to, to address all of these spatial questions. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, our next talk is from uh, another Rob, Rob Robinson again, um, on the effectiveness of Britain's protected areas. Maybe to you, Rob. Yes, hello again, everybody. Um, so now I just want to briefly um, present some results or some work that we've been doing over the last few months um, looking at the effect of us. And this title, said, title, sl title slide says Britain's protected areas, but actually what I really meant was the UK's protected areas, because obviously we have um, some good data from Northern Ireland as well. And again, although um, I'm sort of sitting here presenting uh, all of this work, actually there's a whole bunch of people um, behind it who've actually done quite a lot of the heavy lifting, as it were. Um, Ailey Barnes, Blaise Marte and... Uh, uh, Jacob Davis from BTO, but um, also Rob, in, uh, Rob Boyd, you've just heard from, and um, uh, Rob Cook from UK and Nick from UKCA. So it's very much a team effort. Uh, next slide, please, Anna. Um, so protected areas are obviously sort of an important tool in the conservation toolbox, and we are, um, well, there's ever greater pushes to protect ever greater amounts of areas. Um, but how effective are they? A lot of work has been done looking at the representativity of protected areas. So um, um, as Rob was telling us just now, um, do you get um, sorts of um, the rare or the specialist species in protected areas? Are they are they protected? Um, but what about um, uh, trends and changing and change changes over time very few people have managed to look at that so far and also thinking about what are the wider benefits it's not just the protected um, species that you might want to think about or the designated species but um uh the sort of the, the, the species in the wider countryside next slide please anna um so we're currently in the process of writing a paper for this um there's a quite a lot of detail in the methods uh, but I've summarised it here. So we used um, uh, the large scale monitoring data. So uh, BBS, the Butterfly Monitoring Scheme data, plus also quite a lot of the biological record state, biological record centre data. Um, and we looked to see not only whether species were more abundant in protected and more likely to occur in protected areas, but also whether um, the changes over time were more positive. And importantly, we accounted as far as is possible um, for sort of um, location and habitat, although of course you can't completely separate these things in the sense that protected areas do tend to be in particular habitats. Um, and also we looked at um, differences between um, the designations, so SPAs obviously designated for birds, SACs um, for, wide, uh, for a wider group of taxa, do we see differences in the um, in the results for those uh, those different designations? So next slide please, Anna. So there's a lot there's a lot of information going on on this graph. I'll try and pick out the key things for you. So the bottom set of bar charts um, are looking at sort of um, numbers of species. Um, the top um, sort of box plots are looking at effect sizes. And what we've got um, along the along the axis there is the different measures that we looked at. So occurrence of species um, in 
squares with protected areas, uh, colonizations, persistence. Um, so do, do species tend to remain in those areas? And then abundance and um, trend over time. And we did this for the sort of the four different designation types shown in the different colors there. And very briefly, um, there was um, evidence that species occurred more frequently, so they had higher recurrence and they had higher persistence in square, squares with more protected areas. They also tended to have higher abundance, but they didn't have um, uh, high, uh, more positive trends. And I should say this is um, uh, this is data. This is data for birds from the the breeding bird survey. Uh, we did a, we're in the process of doing a similar analysis for butterflies using the butterfly monitoring survey. Um, and also that um, the effects on SPAs did tend to be more positive than um, SACs. So even though most of the species in this analysis are not the designated species for SPAs, the SPAs are still um, providing benefits for sort of that wider suite of species. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the folks from UKCH looked um, at a much broader suite of species. And here are two examples here for pollinators and for predators. And the top graph shows the sort of the trends over time um, in protected areas in blue and in unprotected areas in uh, red. And I think that the, the, the broad take home from this is um, is similar is that um, protected areas tend to have higher higher um, higher um, occupancy of the of an insect species, but the trends tend not to be more positive over time. So we we do well at the kind of uh, the state, but perhaps um, less well at the actual um, protection. Uh, next slide, please. So just to sum, summarize all of that, because I've gone through it fairly quickly. Uh, so for nearly all groups, we found sites with um, protected. So where, so where you have a greater extent of protected area, you get larger um, uh, you get um, larger numbers of species, so higher species diversity. But for most most uh, groups, we found no difference in trends over time. Um, we did spend a little bit of time looking in a bit more detail at the sorts of species that benefited from protected areas, for, uh, particularly for birds. And uh, rather encouragingly, we found that scarcer species and those of highest conservation concern were, were the species that showed the most positive effects of protected areas. So in that sense, protected areas do seem to be working at a UK scale. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, on to our penultimate talk. Uh, we're going back to Nick Isaac uh, to hear about integrating structured and unstructured data. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nikki. So we we hear a lot about data and, and different types of data. And uh, one of the common taxonomics we taxonomies we use for talking about data is, is the degree of structure it has. So the next slide kind of unpacks that a little bit. We, we have on the left data sets that we call structured tend to have a kind of formal protocol. They tend to have repeated surveys. They tend to measure things like abundance, counts or presence absence. And these are the schemes that we're, we're very familiar with, the breeding bird survey, butterfly monitoring scheme and national plant monitoring scheme. These typically have a few hundred sites or just over a thousand sites in, in a couple of these cases. Um, so they're, they're conceived to be high quality data sets, um, but they sample a relatively small portion of the UK. And then on the other side, we've, we've got these unstructured data sets, data that, that don't really have a, a formal protocol or, or more, more accurately, we don't know what the protocol was. Typically, we believe they derive from fairly ad hoc type of surveys and the types of data that we get from them are presence only. So. Each individual record is of relatively low value. However, there are millions of them from many, many thousands of sites covering uh, with, with very broad coverage across the UK. These are the types of data that we typically refer to as biological records. And, and of course, within the Biological Record Centre, we, 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 we curate many, many millions of those. And typically we've seen these two different types of data as being um, somewhat exclusive. Um, and 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 uh, never the twain shall meet. But increasingly, there are we, we've got we've got taxonomic groups for which we have both types of data, and so the question arises for any one particular application, which should we use? Should we use the the high quality data, 
which is is very rich but but perhaps doesn't have enough sub study sites for us to answer the questions we want or do we use the data set the unstructured data that is covers the whole country um, uh, um, but but with with lower quality information and so the the point of integrated modeling which is kind of su summarized in the next slide is that we we know we no longer have to make that choice and uh, we, we, we've done a lot of work recently to, to, to build the conceptual basis for what we're calling integrated distribution modeling or, or rather um, model based data integration. And a model based data integration uh, basically recognizes the fact that these two different types of data sets uh, were collected in fundamentally different ways. And we, we, can, we can describe them, each data set, using an observation model. An observation model essentially uh, writes is, is an equation or, or an expression that describes the, 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 the protocol that was used. Was it a transect walk or was it a pan trap or, or was it in the case of the biological records? Was it an ad hoc visit? And, and this kind of integrated modeling is becoming um, more common in the ecological statistics literature. So we did a piece of work within TSDA to explore how it could be applied to TPOP schemes more broadly. So I'm going to now show you two case studies that, that we've done within the TSDA project. The first is on the next slide, is an example from the pollinator monitoring scheme. This is work done by my colleague Francesca Mancini here at CEH. The two data sets are on the left is the bee walks data collected by the Bumblebee Conservation Trust which is a transect based scheme modeled very much on the butterfly monitoring scheme. It's a, uh, it's accounts, they, there's counts of bumblebees to species level on transects, and there's a few hundred sites scattered across uh, Great Britain. The, on the right, we've got the, the, the data from the biological records of the bees, wasps and ants recording scheme, which is a much larger data set, uh, but each record is only presence only. So we've been building models to use both data sets together, recognizing that they are collected in different ways to, to estimate trends in 16 common bumblebees uh, using this kind of new statistical approach. Uh, the next slide is an example from birds. This is work by Philip Bursch Supan at BTO, and it's for Chetty's warbler. And Chetty's warbler is one of those species for which the breeding bird survey data on the left isn't quite rich enough to produce a national trend. There you can see that the red squares on the left, this is for, for Norfolk and Suffolk, uh, th there are relatively few sites at which it occurs and so it, it falls just below the threshold for which we can estimate a, a, a trend. But if we add to it the bird track data shown here in right, we've got far more sampling locations and so Philip's work is bringing these two data sets together and fitting a trend model for this species from both data sets for the, for the East Anglia data for, for this species. And so for the bumblebees, we see this as an approach. So next slide is the summary. For bumblebees, we see this as an approach that can bring together data sets to produce a national trend. For the birds, it's, it's more of an approach that we see for regional trends and those species that fall just below the threshold uh, for, for breeding bird survey. Um, it's really uh, the cutting edge of ecological statistics, so um, it, it, it's hard work and we're learning a lot as we go. But um, the, 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 what we've learned so far is that these integrated distribution models, they, they tend to benefit uh, from the, the fact that the structured data have formal protocols. They tend to be relatively unbiased in, in the way that the data are put together. So that, that, that provides a sort of solid backbone uh, to, to for the model to infer the sorts of things that we're interested in about distribution and trend. But it also benefits from that very, very large sample size of the unstructured data. And these two things um, working in, in unison um, in if the model is specified appropriately. And we see a really broad range of applications for these types of models, particularly around uh, local county level um, trends, so the emerging um, local nature partnerships in England and similar similar schemes in Wales and Scotland, where we're, we're interested in, in measuring biodiversity change at the smaller scale. But also when we think about designing new schemes, so POMS, the pollinator monitoring scheme, has been designed explicitly on with integrated modelling in mind. 
And so rather than thinking about what's the best scheme to design from scratch, we can start by looking at what data we've got already and then designing a new scheme that best adds value to the data that we've already got. And uh, I will finish by telling you that uh, as a group, we're, we're working on a how-to guide and Michael Pocock's leading that work uh, to, to produce a how-to guide for integrated modeling for, for agencies. And we'll, that, will be, that will be produced over the next few weeks and months. And I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, we're on to our final talk before we go to some of the questions you've been putting in Jamboard. Um, um, so it's over to Gavin again, um, looking at using scheme data to predict the biodiversity consequences of urban planning options. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, just that. So next slide, please. Thank you. So the, what we're doing with this, the idea is to try to incorporate the quantitative information that we have on, on various taxa from the structured schemes for a following up from Nick's talk into decision making around urban planning. Um, click please, Anna. And so basically we, we can predict that with some variable like urban green space in a, in a planning um, context, we, we can reckon species abundance will go up but the exact shape of that relationship is um, unknown, basically, and we don't know exactly. It's but to be able to say exactly what's going to happen in a given development or a given new new space, urban space, we need to know the shape of that development. So next click, please. And in other words, if we can actually characterize those relationships, we can then predict responses of birds and other things to future development scenarios. And that's a and then um, bring an element of simulation testing. And this is work that, that we've done under TSDA at BTO. Um, this is work led by uh, coll colleagues Kate Plummer and Joe Cooper. So next slide, please. So and click uh, once more. Thank you. So the notion is this is the example for birds, which I'll talk about, which is best developed so far, is we've got the BBS has a range of squares across the country that are in, that inform us about urban habitats, and we can model the um, bird populations with respect to the types of urban, the form of urban habitat that we have in those one kilometre squares from sources like OS Master Map and other places. And next click, please. Um, and another click. Thank you. Uh, so this is this basically shows us that we have a whole range of sites and we can do it for a whole bunch of species. We can do the equivalent for butterflies and for a whole range of variables which try to try to describe the urban habitat as completely as we can with the data that we have and click please. Uh, to do this, we identify then we identify the best, the most important features for the for the species we're modeling. We, and then we identify the best models from those different features and then we can quantify the net effects of a whole range of scenarios. So next slide. Thank you. And what we have here is a range of scenarios we, we've, we've tested this against. So we're looking at things like if you take a given new development and you apply, you say all, right, all the green space can be is in parks instead of in gardens or we let the green space go to rewilding context as opposed to a managed context and so on in diff different ways of, of playing what it looks like. And we add water bodies. What does this do to the, 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 um, the, the uh, wildlife that, can't, that lives in those situations as a result? And if we can do this, then we get a, something which will enable a planet, a planner or a developer to play with um, what these new developments might look like and output the real populations that they can expect to to find from those in those developments after they are built. So it's a gate kind of a gaming thing, really. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the results, what they look like is this is all species specific as a fundamental model. So we have species specific predictions and the graph here is an example that shows the differences between a scenario and the baseline. So some species, the numbers are going up and some species, the numbers are predicted to go down. Um, click please. We can then combine those species level results into uh, diversity indices or other community level uh, summaries of what is going to happen. 
And what this shows is that for these different developments that we've tested and looked at these scenarios across, we actually find that there are differences, but they're not always the same. So depending on the shape of the development, what it looks like, the, where it is in the country, the local landscape context and so on, different things happen in different places. So there are there are sort of fairly complex decisions that this can inform um, for planners to aid with decision making. So click please. And yeah, that can then in inform the choice. It's part of it's never going to drive everything that people um, do to, around planning, but it can in contribute to the to the choice of uh, different style of development, if you like, and particularly what people do with green space within these developments. Next slide. And conclude. So yeah, click on this sort of uh, one more. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So what we're doing here is um, is looking at something which can inform the whole biodiversity net gain world, which currently only really considers habitat type and area actually in the DEFRA tool that is used for this. Um, we can do much more detailed evaluations if we can fit the models and the models work. So we've done that for birds and it works reasonably well. Um, and we are currently doing it for butterflies. The data um, availability is not so great for butterflies, but still it looks pretty promising from the initial results we have on that. Um, we may also be able to do it with bats. Uh, but for other taxa, the limiting factor is the availability of suitable structured data to support these models at the right spatial scale. And also the extent to which people do that, that recording, that monitoring within uh, sort of more urban areas to support the analyses. Um, but for this stuff to work, it needs to be accessible to the people who we are going to use it, planners, developers, local, local government ecologists and whoever. And so our plan is to try to develop this as some as an online tool or an app that will able pe enable people to put in their can input their the what the sites how they would change the development and then to output the results in terms of bird predictions, which would be a novel a novel output for the use of scheme data, and we want to do it for multiple taxa. And that's all I was going to say. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gavin, and thanks to all of our speakers. Um, that was a really great set of talks. Um, we've got three questions that have come in so far, um, so a couple of minutes on each of these now. Um, the first one is for Stuart, um, and it says, really exciting to hear about the BTO pipeline. Wonderful to see the exciting new tech being put into practice. Following on from Nick and Michael's talks, could Stuart reflect on what he thinks are the mo important metadata we need to collect to ensure auto ID observations are interoperable and reusable in the future? Also, if there's time, I'd be interested to hear any lessons learned from setting up an auto ID pipeline, since I'm guessing this won't be the last. Um, I think, well, I think one of the most important things is um, class classifiers are developing the whole time and um, I think at the current stage, it's really valuable to keep a copy of the, the recordings to be able to go back and reprocess the data. Um, and as I'm finding more and more, um, for example, I've been working on uh, micro moth identification, sound identification, and building in new species of micro moth. And this is kind of a really new area where there's probably a lot of species that I don't know about uh, producing high frequency sound and perhaps I could build these in in the future. So being, a, being able to go back and reprocess the whole lot again with the latest classifiers is really valuable. Um, I think then um, there is a metadata system called Guano, which is being used by a lot of uh, bat detectors now, and that's really valuable because it collects in a standardized way things like the, mod, the model and make of detector. Uh, not all bat detectors are using this yet, um, but increasingly more and more are. So I think that's introducing that's been really valuable. Um, there was a second question, but I can't remember what it was now. Uh, there's yeah the lessons learned side of things and making sure observations are interoperable and reusable were the two sections. Okay, I I think I've I think I've probably covered those unless anyone has any specific questions. 
We'll uh, let people put more specific questions into the Jamboard if they have them to follow on then. And we'll move on to the next question, which is a late one for Michael. Um, I've revisited some, oops, sorry, I failed to see this all. Um, I've revisited some orthoptera squares, but often, especially in urban areas, they are just one-off records, maybe of a bush cricket. And it's tempting just to record one easy species of... Uh, I can't actually see the rest of this. One easy species of grasshopper and consider job done. Without a complete list style approach, isn't there a danger the pink squares will introduce new biases relating to detectability and give the impression of more assemblage chain than that change than there is in reality? Um, yeah, that's a really helpful reflection. And whoever um, made that it would be lovely if you were able to expand on that a bit within the feedback within the targeting revisits tool. I think I suppose that's a reflection both on the fact that this is a brand new approach um, which could be seen as a slightly gamified approach to um, bring in some more structure to some of the unstructured data that we're collecting and the novelty of that in terms of us thinking about well what is the what is the clarity of the ask that we that we are asking people to do and, and what's the strength of the nudge and in that case, that might be a reflection on the fact that this nudge is or the, the gamification is is almost too strong for that. So so these are all things which we will be reflecting on during the phase of evaluation. So thank you for that. Thanks, Michael. Um, and the last question we've got here is for Rob. Um, were the positive effects for scarcer bird species due to better trends in protected areas or due to worse trends in unprotected areas? i.e. are these birds doing well in protected areas or just worse outside? Good question. I'd need to look at the results in a bit more detail to answer that. Um, I think it's because, 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 because we looked at the trends themselves, I think it is because they are doing better in protected areas rather than necessarily because they're doing worse outside. But I suspect to a, to, to, to a certain extent it's a bit of both. Sorry, that's okay. not a terribly helpful answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, that's all the questions we've got here. Um, I know there's been an awful lot to digest from that um, quick fire series of talks. Um, but hopefully you've uh, learnt a lot from it and um, are as enthusiastic and excited about all the areas of work are, um, that, uh, as we are in the TSDA partnership. Um, I think it's achieved an awful lot over its five years. Um, so we're keen to talk more to anybody who wants to talk about it. Um, do get in touch. Um, and once again, thank you very much to all of our speakers today. Um, it's been a really great event. And I think just to round it off, Anna has some finishing thoughts. So I will pass back over to her. Thank you, Nikki. So I felt that a, t a celebration event is never complete without an awards ceremony. So on a slightly light hearted note, I'd like to announce the following awards to members of the TSDA management group. Do you ever wonder whether your project is glass half full or glass half empty? Well, if you discuss your project with the winner of this award, you would come away with your glass at least three quarters full. And as we have just seen in the TSDA project, there has been a massive amount achieved, so a lot to be positive and enthusiastic about. Just ask the winner of this award. So the winner of the Wild Enthusiast Award is Michael Pocock. Of course, in a team, it's useful to have a mix of different characters to balance each other out. A realist, for example, is particularly good at judging what's feasible to achieve and knowing when it's better to stop work on a topic and invest energies elsewhere. In the TSDA project, the winner of the Wise Realist Award goes to Gavin Siriwadina. A team is at its best when working in harmony together. Whilst everyone involved has been a team player, a special award for this goes to a particular member of the management group. As well as always being polite and helpful, in the days when we held meetings in person, this team member facilitated good working relations by routinely bringing Portuguese custard tarts to management group meetings. Mm. So the team player or pie provider award goes to Rob Robinson. 
On the subject of pies, the next award goes to the management group member who has his finger in the most pies, metaphorically speaking, of course. Looking through the outputs list, I realised that Nick Isaac is named on 14 TSDA reports, many of them published papers. So Nick wins the Report Proliferator, otherwise known as Finger in Most Pies Award. <laughs> Finally, sticking with the culinary theme, I'd like to give the Chief Plate Spinner Award to Nikki Newton. <laughs> although Nikki hasn't taken Although JNCC hasn't taken the lead role in as many TSDA tasks as BTO and CEH, JNCC have led on some projects tasks within it, and Nikki has done a grand job at keeping on top of many, many strands of work in the TSDA project, providing direct input to many and coordinating with colleagues and members of the advisory group. And as you can see, she hasn't dropped any yet. Only six months to go. So a big congratulations to all our worthy award winners today. And that concludes our event today. So thank you everybody for coming and do keep in touch with us um, at that email address there and let us know if you'd like to be added to the mailing list for the teapot bulletin that we send around quarterly. And yeah, thank you again to all our speakers. Thank you for coming and we're planning to put the recording of this event up on JNCC's YouTube channel. So look out for that and hopefully see you at some of the remaining TPOP events later in the next few weeks. So thank you everyone. <laughs>